Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Belgian Football Podcast. My name is Ben Jackson and I'll be your host and as always I'm joined by Scott and yours. Scott and yours, how are you guys doing this evening? Hi guys, hello everyone. Hope you're all enjoying our constant stream of content. Feels like we've been pumping out some stuff recently. Yeah, feels like I've been editing all week long. <laughs> and, oh, actually that's what I have done. What have you guys done this weekend? <laughs> Might have watched a bit of Belgian football, the rumour has it. Let's go quickly over the results from this weekend. If you did manage to fit any in while you were trying to listen to all of our podcasts, I salute you. In the midweek games, we had Zodavaragam drawing 0-0 with Oostend and Leuven beating Genk two goals to one. On to this weekend that just passed. On Friday night, we had Salang against Antwerp. Um, somehow that only finished 1-0 to Antwerp. We also had Erpen against Ghent. That finished 1-0 to Ghent. A lot of symmetry, actually, between those two games in terms of scoreline and cards had Handed out. Leuven and Cler- Circler Bruges played out a really entertaining 3 2 game that finished 3 2 to the host Leuven. Uh, Mechelen put three past Oostend at home with no reply. Zalta lost at home 2 1 to Anderlecht. Genk beat Standard two goals to nil. Union lost surprisingly to St. Truden that finished 1 0 to the Canaries. Club Bruges got back to winning ways with a 2 0 win over Charleroi. And Beerscott got a surprise win. They beat Cord Slyke on Sunday evening. Let's start then with the Salang against Antwerp game. And if you're an Antwerp fan, you'd probably have been shocked that you weren't three goals up within the first half an hour because you had so many chances in this one. Miyoshi was kind of the culprit to begin with. Uh, he missed, well, he kind of inadvertently got in the way of an absolute probably sitter for Balakrisha at the back post. Not sure, He might have been offside from it, but I'm not sure. But Miyoshi kind of got the last touch on it when if he'd left it, Balakrisha would have tapped it in. But even then, Miyoshi probably could have got a nice better touch on it to put it past the goalkeeper Dietz who was kind of nowhere Miyoshi was then again played in within about five minutes of that by nine good it was a really nice like build-up play from Antwerp that kind of started it through to Miyoshi but he couldn't get his shot past Dietz either and yeah that's kind of how it continued in the first half Antwerp creating lots of chances Salang understandably uh, only 33% possession looking to play from that kind of counter-attacks which you, you can't really blame them when you look at kind of their predicament and how their teams lined up and uh, Mikatadze had a reasonably good chance in the first half that he absolutely blazed wide. We were super, super isolated at times. Him and Maziz throughout the game were quite isolated. But somehow, nil-nil at half time. Uh, into the second half, kind of pattern continued until Mbwana Samata got himself sent off for, I, I guess you could say, quite a reckless looking tackle. Um, he did technically win the ball. Referee initially gave it a red. VAR kind of told him to have a look at it and he stuck with his original decision, which. Whether you and he said whether you agree with what the referee decides or not, it is kind of nice for them to go and look at VR and actually think. No, I I was right to begin with because uh, usually, regardless of what you think about the decision, the ref goes over to that TV screen and they ninety nine times out of a hundred will change that. But he stuck with it and decided to keep the red card for some matter. Um, we just kind of opened it up a little bit for Sarang playing with a man advantage. Massive, massive penalty shout for them. I think it was in like the eighty first minute or eighty second minute. Wasn't taken to VR and wasn't given, uh, which started a little bit of controversy. And unfortunately for them, they did finally concede through the most bizarre of goals. I think it was kind of across the back post lands and Dini Almeida's there. He tries to shoot. He, he doesn't really, I don't think he's getting it on target. It takes a few deflections off Deech and kind of rolls in. Pitch wasn't great, to be fair, for football. It was, it's been cutting up a lot and it really did cut up on the weekend. But Antwerp will be happy that they finally did get the win. Uh, but Scott and Yoss, I think they'd have expected from the performance that they'd have put a few more goals past Arang. Yeah, definitely, definitely. In the first half, it should have already been decided, as you mentioned. And then, well, the way that that goal went in, like, I guess it's an own assist for an own goal, even, if so to say. So that, uh, well, very ma- many deflections taken there and, well, a bit unlucky. I felt a bit sorry for Deitch because also after the the, the goal, the Antwerp just had one, well, impossible shot as well that he didn't uh, handle so well. Well, in the end, it didn't cost him much, but I think he gave away a corner or something there. And, like, he clearly was a bit, well, shocked after well, how that goal went in, I guess. But, and, uh, well, I felt for him, but deserved to win, definitely. So, uh, yeah, they still just can't draw, which they probably will want to get anyway. I think Antwerp will be delighted to have got the points, particularly, you know, bearing in mind what happened in, in Brussels a little bit later in the day as well, um, with the with the shock result, probably the shock result of the weekend. That's just applied a little bit more pressure to, to Union. 
I think, which is what obviously the side's trying to hunt them down just now are kind of trying to trying to do most of all uh, to see how they respond to that. I think Sarang's inability to, as Joris was saying, you know, pick up pick up a point must be hugely frustrating to them, especially, you know, with Zalta losing as well, then that point could have been really, really valuable down there at the bottom, but it wasn't to be and they have a they have a big game coming up against uh, Zalta shortly, uh, which is going to have a big say in the way things go. Good job by Antwerp. The machine rolls on and I think they'll be they'll be they'll be pretty happy with their weekend's work. Yeah, no, definitely that like you said, kind of with the shock result, that puts them just seven points behind Union now. Goal difference is quite a big disparity. I think you can that that's where you can kind of see the difference between the two sides and that Antwerp are only the other team alongside Union who have still yet to concede 30 goals this season, like everyone else is 30 or above. But Union have put 59 in and Antwerp have only put 47 in. And I think that's where the frustration has been with a couple of the fans and stuff around the style of play and that. But it's another clean sheet on the weekend and they, that's what they've been doing well at. They grind out these 1-0 wins. It's not always pretty. This one, I think we're all in agreement, should have been prettier than it was. Um, they really should have scored more and they had the chances to score more. Um, I did uh, the first 30 minutes was really great football to watch from them. Miyoshi, like I said, was the culprit for a couple of the missed chances. Nyingalan was like pulling the strings in midfield. Delat as well was like bombing up from the left hand side, uh, creating chances from that, from like overlapping runs and stuff against Daniel Lapare. So, yeah, I think it was one of those games where for Salang, I mean, it was almost like a free hit. You'd probably, if you could get a joy, you'd have been happy, but we know that's not how they work. Whereas for Antwerp, it was like, yeah, we've played well and we've got the win in the end, but it'd have been nice to get a little bit more kind of daylight between the two sides. I was speaking before doing that roundup about the symmetry and then Erpen against Ghent. It's kind of like a similar, I guess, reverse in terms of when the goals were scored, but the winning team only scored one goal and got a man sent off. So we had kind of two back-to-backs in that <laughs> sense. Yeah, Ghent in this one took the lead through Laurent de Potra. What a season he's having at that age. I mean, you probably, people kind of confer compare him to a fine wine, getting better with age, all that sort of stuff that people say. But his goal was just fantastic. Really, really lovely volley into the far corner in the 15th minute. And yeah, Ghent were busy in this one. They created a fair amount, put uh, Nuruddin under some pressure. I mean, he wasn't massively convincing with a couple of saves, but a couple of saves he did make were quite good. However, Matthias Samwars was sent off in the second half in the f- on the 51st minute, I believe, for... Yeah, it just looked pretty innocuous. It was one of those ones where he just doesn't get to the ball quick enough, but it's over the top. That's one of those ones that referees are just giving nowadays. I didn't think it was like it wasn't like a horrific tackle or anything like that, but it was just one of those once he's given it, he's probably not going to change his mind. But Urpen, it's a, yeah, I guess it's another frustrating result for them at home to only lose one goal to nil, but to still that's kind of what five games at least now without a win, two defeats on the bounce. It's just yeah, you can see from the side that they're putting out again. Don't want to make this excuse for them that they are kind of struggling in key areas. Your map being out, I think, is definitely a miss. They don't look as good when it's not Prevel Yakin and Goy up front. I'm confused as to why that wasn't the starting lineup and stuff like that. And then Conan and Dree a few weeks ago was playing really well, and suddenly he's not in the team. He's always coming off the bench because that some players have come back fit. So I think there's some kind of fit issues and stuff like that in terms of who's playing where and how they're lining up, but. For Ghent, they'll be happy after going down to 10 men to come away with another win. So that's at least, yeah, with the, Bru- the win against Club Bruges and then following up with this nice one and a reasonable nice 1-0 win against Urpen will make them happy and keeps that pressure on, I guess, for the top four. I think for me, I think U- Urpen are playing with a, a slight lack of confidence at the moment. I was saying that to you guys, obviously, when we were watching the game, that the, it was kind of obvious to see. And for me, it was all about some of the the pass selection was the big giveaway, particularly at the back. Um, there were some square balls there and some back passes that, that were just, you know, the absolute worst pass and the wrong pass they could have made at those moments as well. And I thought you know that's that's a sign you know that's a wee bit jittery you know some of some of the balls out uh, from Naradine as well were, were a bit suspect too I thought you know he's, he's putting his own defence under pressure there when they're already you know low on confidence and he didn't need to do that so that that was quite telling I thought Eppin much better in the second half actually their intensity was better you know and they, they they had a go and you know they made a decent decent game of it in the end Ghent on the other hand controlled the majority of the game and, and looked very good and probably should have won this by more than the than De Poitras' brilliant goal, fantastic goal, one of the, one of the two real beauties we had this weekend. I, I thought Ghent were, were looking pretty good for the most part actually. And you know, they're the professional job 
I, I quite enjoyed watching them this weekend. It's not often something I say because often they can be effective without being particularly enjoyable to watch. Um, so it was nice for me, certainly, on a personal note, to be able to say that I, I enjoyed watching the Buffaloes this weekend. For Urban also, just a bit sad. A very nice free kick from Prevaliak that goes in and then... I feel bad for him because that free kick would have been gone in anyway, but there was a clear fall uh, and, and ridiculous in that sense. And I guess, I guess from I think it was Musel, Musel, and anyway, an upper player that brought a few players in the in the wall uh, down, and uh, that was disallowed. And yeah, that, too bad for that because it was really a quality free kick. Um, I have the impression that the last few months we've had seen a lot of those i was also wondering you mentioned it already why why is Andre not starting because he's had quite an impact coming on as a substitute in the past few uh, weeks yeah i i don't really get why he's not starting and um well unfortunately for Gent, it seems like in this game definitely at least this is definitely not necessarily the score the solution to their scoring problem but uh, of course, uh, the Patres goal makes it not uh, not necessary. But he probably should have gotten a few. It was also addressed even by his coach uh, in the post post match interview. When talking about post match interviews, yeah, well, at least Kramer is still saying like I really believe in it and we will save us. So at least he's get to getting that energy in the interview. Let's hope for him and for the club that uh, he can also put that confidence back into the players because yeah, that will be necessary. I don't think they need much. I have been saying that for I think four months now, basically, <laughs> that, that they just need a few more wins to be completely safe, and they just don't happen. Yeah, no, like you were saying, there, yours, they are four points above Salang at the moment. Uh, obviously, with Zul Tavag game in between them. So, I th- yeah, I think I, I think they have enough. I think they have the players there. I think it's just getting them in the right system and putting them in the right places. And I think I think Kalema deserves the chance to see out the season. I think he will. I think they'll stay up. I think they have enough. I think they've got goals. They've got good midfield. They've got good defenders when they're fit. But at the moment, I think the only centre-back, usual suspect centre-back that's starting... In this game was Agbadu, so it's usually Harris, Agbadu, and Amat, but unfortunately they haven't all been fit together. So yeah, it's more Conan and Dree, please. That's what we're requesting. Let's finally get to some goals, then, shall we? We had two one nils in a row, and then we got a three-two game between Circle Bruges. And I feel like the, the kind of theme for this episode might be symmetry because there was symmetry between the two opening goals in this one. Ravi Matondo gives Circle the lead. And there's a shot from like, Ben Deman from the right hand side of the box. That is basically spilled by Runnison into the path of Matondo, who taps it in. Go down the other end, and I think it's uh, Musa Al Tamari with a shot from the right hand side of the circular box, which is spilled by Didion, and Mertens taps it in. So they were like, okay, we'll go, we'll go tete a tete, we'll go kind of give each other the same sort of goals. Then, 43rd minute, circular's number nine, uh, Kevin Denke scores with a header from a, a really nicely. Well, put in set piece. Shout out to Kevin Denke. He's kind of struggled this season, but now he's starting to find the back of the net on a more regular basis, which is good to see for him. Um, I quite liked what I saw from him at the back end of last season. He struggled to kind of break into the side this year, but obviously with Milan going and kind of the way the kind of some injuries have worked, he's managed to get a starting place and he looks good for it. Leuven then replied with their number nine with a header. Really, really good header actually from Sorry Cabra in the 63rd minute to continue his really good scoring run since coming back from the AFCON. Ball basically kind of crossed in sort of behind him and he kind of has to like lean back and then push use all that neck muscle and the power to kind of guide it into the far corner. Really good header from him. Unfortunately for Circle that was it in terms they didn't then go set the precedent for the next kind of similar goal that will score. Uh, just four minutes later, Musa Altamari kind of seizes on a pretty bit of poor defending from Circular to go one on one with the keeper. Miang's putting him under some pressure, but he kind of sees him off on a really nice finish from him that gives them the 3 2 win. Back to back wins in a space of a week for Leuven with that one and the win over Ghent. That gives them three wins on the bounce, unbeaten in four. And they've gone from kind of languishing a little bit down at the bottom of the table all the way up to ninth. Um, which just shows how tight it is in that in that kind of spaces. They've also got a game in hand. They're right back in with a shout of playoff two now, uh, thanks to that win over Genk and then the win now. So yeah, really good little kind of turnaround in the space of a week for Leuven, hasn't it? Yeah, Leuven had uh, have a nine got got a nine points out of nine uh, this this last week in. Well, Cirque only got one point out of nine, so I guess their honeymoon period under Talhammer. Is is uh, is over? Of course, when you're two one ahead, 
you 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 don't want expect to lose anymore and you would expect to win and they didn't uh, put it over the line Löwe well did a good job Kaba is on a scoring streak as well uh, I think I've also put him in this in the team of the week that was not necessarily for one specific performance but just for well actually the whole week this time since they, they did get the three wins and he scored in all three of them so he's been really crucial for them especially since we've been talking about their scoring um, or strikers striker issues uh, without him for sure yeah also without Hotic even then like uh, the, the free kick team I'm, I'm dragging along for a few weeks now <laughs> Hotic without sick for circle so there was no issue because they still scored on a free kick uh, with the header from Denki on the on the free kick from Velkovsky. Circle a bit on a, a little bit on a down f- form and Leuven really gathered form. So that are the things here. And now, well, they both can, can be aiming for playoff two spots. Yeah, it was interesting, wasn't it? This week in a, the, the pre-match press conference for this game, Dominic Talhammer said he thought this game would be all about the transitions. Very specific about that. And that the winner would be the side who made the most of their transitions. And I think Leuven did, did do marginally better on the transition play when you look at it. So um, he wasn't wrong. It just didn't go the way that he would have wanted. What a difference a week makes. Ben was saying a couple of wins for Leuven now and as Joris was was uh, highlighting as well you know it's no coincidence that Sorry Kaba is really kind of on quite a rich vein of form at the moment and um, much like when Thomas Henry was was at Leuven last season and uh, he was firing at all cylinders when, when there's a striker that, that that's feeling good about himself and, and, and playing quite well then it tends to kind of you know rub off on, on the rest of the side at Leuven you know and the same thing seems to have been happening here. They've, they've obviously had a a slightly disappointing season um, and they find it kind of frustrating I think to reshape the squad slightly and just find that that balance again but things seems to have finally settled down now after after a quiet window for them as well and that that, that was a great result for them. Circle will be fine, this is just one of those that, that really kind of got away from them I think. They'll be slightly frustrated. I thought Altamari's goal was brilliant actually, really really good. Counter attacking goal, a perfect run at the right time you know, right pass, right movement, great finish. Uh, Love goals like that. They're the sort of ones that get me up out of my seat because you think, yep, everything, the A, the B, the C and the D are all kind of perfect. It's it's, um, a a T1 and and a video analyst dream those sorts of goals. Do this do this more often. Good game, good game and I didn't see all of this one actually, I was only able to see the highlights of this one because I was I was watching another game at the same time. Beautifully transitioned there <laughs> Scott, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, so there was another side scoring three goals but they didn't concede any. Mechelen against East End, three goals nil to the host Mechelen and it just felt like you know Mechelen are good and they're really fun to watch, it felt like this is one of those games where like you see some of the goals and you're like yeah they're Mechelen goals. I don't know how to describe them but they just are. Um, the first one, especially from Mirabti, like just lovely play with him and Kuipers down the side. Kuipers playing it back to him. Mirabti just kind of rolling it in. And yeah, into the second half, we'll obviously dive more into some of these goals, but Marion Shred's goal was just beautiful just kind of the whole kind of build up to it it was a corner from Schuf's that looked it looked deliberate in the sense that Schuf's looked like he was putting enough on the ball to get it to Shred I don't think he expected Shred to then bring it down flick it around do the little turn and then finish like he did but he did which is great to see great to see him kind of getting more time because of some of the injuries and making the most of it but then Rob Schuf's was like okay I've seen that I'll do one of my own. Um, he only scores good goals. And this goal was just fantastic. Just rifles it into the top left-hand corner. Um, don't know from how far out, but it was really, really good. 3-0, that was uh, East End, on the other hand. Only one shot on target. New manager has been announced uh, as of this week. Not the best kind of start to life under Eve van der Haag. Scott will do a deep dive on him, but I'm sure most of you actually know who Eve van der Haag is <laughs> by now. You've been around enough. Yeah, really, really good performance for Mechelen, good win for Mechelen. Scott, did you feel like you were, that just felt like a Mechelen kind of performance for me in terms of the goals and the guys that scored them and the atmosphere and like the performance as a whole? Yeah, absolutely. It had all those kind of classic, you know, tick, 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 you know, things that you were talking about there. Marin Shved's goal was, was really good, a really kind of instinctive kind of clinical finish as well. I think he, he enjoyed that and that's exactly the sort of thing he needs to kind of be doing more often because he, he can do that. I think the story of this game obviously is the goal of the game and probably the goal of the weekend 
and Rob Scoof's absolute belter from about 30 yards. That, that It got me up out of my seat, actually, when I was watching the game, just because it was one of those. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's your side or not. Unless it's against your team, of course, then you would have you would have been up. Out of Rankin's reaction was brilliant, actually, the way he kind of jumped onto the pitch and kind of went down in his knees like he'd scored it himself. It was, was was really lovely. I love that kind of heart in the sleeve, all abound in joy stuff. Pretty decent performance from from Mecklen. Ustend, interestingly, for the majority of the first half, were decent, actually. They were kind of quite aggressively pressing Mecklen, trying not to give them time in the ball. And for a good chunk of the game, their game plan was actually working. You know, they were denying them a space. They were squeezing it. There was, you know, probably more unforced errors and lack of successful transitions than than they would have liked. And then I think the the opening goal of the game just kind of opens the whole game up, obviously. Um, and that's, that's what changed things for me. Uh, that was quite a nice goal in itself, actually. A nice free-flowing move. But yeah, all, all textbook Mecklen goals um, in a way. I think... It's going to be interesting to see what Usain do now. Um, you mentioned Eve van der Heij kind of coming back, and we'll, we'll we'll talk about him in a little while. I, I didn't feel offensively that Usain offered too much in this game. You know, I was talking about how their game plan worked for for the majority of the first half, and it did, but w- without kind of creating too many opportunities for them. So they're they're going to have to do a little bit more than than what they did there. Um, I think they have a decent squad. Their transfer window was all right, as we've already talked about. It just kind of needs to, to, to sort of come together for them. Of course, ironically, Ivan der Hayes' last game um, at Circle before he was sacked was, was a win over Mechelen. Um, so there was some interesting chat this weekend about you know his first game being back in management, being against Mechelen, and whether that would be a good sign for him. It wasn't, unfortunately. No, it definitely wasn't. Uh, well, you guys didn't leave me much uh, to talk about, but indeed, all three quality goals uh, of Mechelen. I personally enjoyed uh, Schwedt's goal most. That's uh, that's a personal taste, I guess. And uh, of course, it was still really nice to see uh, Schoffs uh, getting, well, actually just putting in a really brilliant performance outside of his goal already. And also getting a goal uh, in his 150 game for Mechelen. Yeah, I guess there's not that much about the same more uh, that you didn't guys didn't say about the game anymore. But uh, definitely worth highlighting that there's a well a really important week for Mechelen and their and, and potential ambitions or just their ambitions in this season uh, ahead uh, with games against Henk in the midweek and in, against Antwerp uh, in on the weekend to see where they stand after that. And Ostend, there was not much this weekend. That they, I can't really say much uh, ex- extra anymore. No, it wasn't the, the East End we kind of... I know, I know it's not the East End we saw last year. That's like a stupid thing to say, but it's not this, it just didn't doesn't feel like the same sort of gung-ho, we're going to kind of give it to you we play on our terms. We're not going to be dictated to. It just felt that they're kind of quite overwhelmed. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see what sort of job he does there because obviously he came into Circular, kept them up. He's kind of, it's like again, it's like kind of a repeat of last year in terms of he's come in to do the job to stay up. But is he the man they see for the future going ahead? Who is that person if they don't? Like come the summer, what what decision they're going to make? Yeah, we'll see. We'll see kind of what direction that takes them in. One side that yeah probably need to start making a decision about where they want to head. And they probably want to kind of stay where they are and move up. Is Zolta Uh They hosted Anderlecht uh, on the in the evening game on Saturday. Uh, finished two one to Anderlecht. Uh, Anderlecht straight out of the box quite quickly in this one. They had quite a few chances tested. Sammy Bossett on I think it was was it his like four hundredth appearance or something. It was like a big milestone appearance for him this weekend. So. Congratulations to him. Shame for him it wasn't in a win and he actually made a mistake for the first goal for Christian Kwame when he fluffed across. But to be fair to him, since he's come back in as the, the kind of like number one, he has made some good saves for them and kept them in some games despite the overall performances of the side. What's quite interesting that Jean-Luc Dompe wasn't starting this one. Uh, instead, they went for the youngster Dylan de Nerve. Dompe did come on in the second half and actually made a difference, but yeah, he wasn't starting and it was Anderlecht that started bright. As I said, Christian Kwame with the opening goal. Xerxes had a few chances, lots of them kind of peppering shots on the uh, Zoldovar game goal. It was Rafael who scored the second one. Really nice kind of build-up play and Ashimeru with a really nice pass through to Rafael and his finish was just sublime. Like a nice little dink over Bossett to make it 2-0. To be fair to Zolta, they didn't give up uh, in the second half. They started to push again and really try and get back into the game. Zeno Gana had a couple of chances before he finally scored one. Van Kronberger made a really decent save off a deflection in the first half to tip it over the bar. But in the second half, he not much. He couldn't really get to the Gano goal. I think it was Dompe again involved as he 
had been since he came back onto the pitch. I just don't understand unless he's got a niggle and a slight injury why you wouldn't start him because he is your most kind of explosive player and he provides for the likes of Gano and Vossen when Vossen's fit when he's on the pitch. So, however, they couldn't get all the way back into the game losing this one 2 one which isn't like it's not the end of the world in terms of they'd have expected to lose to Anderlecht and only losing 2-1 is probably a pretty decent performance but in the grand scheme of things they haven't won for so long now they're only three points ahead of Solang who obviously aren't doing that well themselves but you can't rely on that continuously I don't know guys do you think Anderlecht maybe should have put more of their chances away and made this less of a tight affair I, I don't understand Anderlecht sometimes. I mean, the first half, they were really pretty good, particularly that opening 20 minutes. They were swarming all over Zalta, eh, much like they were against Eupen the other week in the league games, where looking very, very good, you know, like they were going to score every time they went forward. And Zalta were were rocking for a lot of that first half. And sometimes when I watch Zalta, I think, do you do you guys realise that you're you're in trouble? Because they, they, they tend to only start playing some of their football when they go behind, you know, and, and I thought talked about this a while ago and what a bad habit that was you know this game kind of exemplifies that a wee bit for me you know uh, they, they made some changes at half time which I think they needed to make they were a lot better um, they had a right go in the second half and a lot of people have given Zalta credit for how good they were in the second half I I think it's not quite as simple as that I think Anderlecht kind of dropped off because my feeling is they thought they'd won the game to be honest that honestly is my reading of it they didn't look particularly engaged or interested in the second half and it's just so odd to see a side who can set such a level in in one half of a game for it to drop off as 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 markedly as as it did and that's that's a that's more than game management i think that's a psychological thing as well there's no doubt about it because there's no reason why that 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 should have been the case they should have won this by a lot more actually and could have be, could have been out of sight by by half time and they've only got themselves to blame for that i think if they have real aspirations to go and win the title which we know they do, of course they do, it's Anderlecht we're talking about here, as they should, that they're going to have to cut that out of their game um, in the same way that Zulta are going to have to cut out this kind of perpetually slow starting games. It just, you know, they, 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 there needs to be a sense of urgency to what they do. And I think if they can start games a little bit more positively, then... You know, it wouldn't be a shock probably to see them start picking up some more points as well. So some some quite interesting and fundamental things about both these sides' games, I think, for for both both head coaches to go away and have a think about. Again, not that much to say uh, as that you guys didn't say uh, yet. Indeed, Andre should have killed that game way earlier. Probably some trivial things then. Uh, Murillo, Murillo and, and Sek uh, checking on the VAR screen. That was quite funny. I'm not sure if it's allowed. I don't think so. But that was funny. The other side of the coin, unfortunately, VAR was not able to actually draw a potential offside line for Vrishare, who was blocking the box uh, side and was behind Bosut, the first goal. Well, if if Vrishare was in the same... uh, If there were some Zulte defenders, uh, or at least one extra, um, lifting that offside... We will never know, but they really just couldn't draw the line, which is just ridiculous, actually. But okay, doesn't matter. In the end, very much a deserved win for Anderlecht, and they should have uh, won it, well, more clearly. A few big misses, definitely, as well. Indeed, a, a bit of a typical game for both sides, uh, I suppose. Don Pe got an assist for the, I think, his first assist in a while, and he's been crucial with, with assists all season long, so that, that might be good for uh, Zulte Warrior. I thought one of the funny things about this game, actually, was was uh, the, the halftime interviews. I don't know if, if, if everyone knows, but for those of you who don't, it's um, it's been commonplace uh, in the Pro League now for a number of years for there to be brief interviews with some of the players at half time before they head to the dressing room and uh, Sek was interviewed uh, for Zalta and he, he was having a right moan about uh, he felt that Anderlecht's opening goal, Kwame's goal should have been chopped off because he was arguing that the ball had minutely in all probability brushed uh, Versharan's hair you know so he wanted that chopped off for interference which which was desperation of a kind that you know I, I haven't seen in, in, in a long time But well it doesn't matter he blocked the box side so if he touched it or not doesn't even matter he influences play yeah. so no that would have not had yeah. even have mattered it's just really if he was in that position or not but we'll never know <laughs> that was the that was that was the hill that he chose to die on that was the thing that i found funny i, I just <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah choices eh it kind of reminds me i forgot to mention it earlier in the um 
Salang Antwerp game, I don't know if you guys saw Morgan Poati's uh, boot fell off and he tied his laces up far too tight. He couldn't undo them. Um, so he's there trying, and trying, and trying. He, he goes to the ref and like it's like when you go to your dad when you were a kid or your parents or like the coach on the side, like, can you just do my laces for me? And to the ref, the ref looks at him like, who do you think I am? Gives it a go <laughs> and then he's like, oh, I can't do it either. So he goes to the side and gives it to one of the coaches and they're like, well, we can't do it either. And it was just this whole like farce about Poati not being able to untie his shoes. But <laughs> if anyone's ever played like kids football, you, you'll remember you having exactly the same experience as him. And there was always a kid in your team that just couldn't do their laces and you always had to wait for them. So that was Morgan Poati. That was kind of one of my moments of this weekend. But Anyway, that should have come in the earlier section, but I just completely forgot about it until then. Let's give Genk a bit of time. Joris can be a little bit happier with the result this weekend. 2-0 win over Standard Liège. Uh, Tia Bongonda opened the scoring on the 44th minute. Really nice finish from him. Yeah, quite even in terms of possession. Both sides willing to like kind of share the ball and allow each other to have the ball. 52% for the away side Standard, but only four shots on target. For Genk, they managed 15 shots overall, but only six on target, but two of them went in, so that's all that matters. Paul Onowachi got another goal, but it was, yeah, not really comparable to some of the good goals we've saw, seen this weekend. It just about trickled over the line eventually. Genk hold on for a win standard. Unfortunately, that's another defeat for them. And we were actually asked a question for last weekend about who's more likely to kind of reach a playoff it was were Genk more likely to reach playoff one or standard more likely to reach playoff two I mean the answer is probably for neither but if you had to do it more likely I would have said standard to reach playoff two just because I think it's the gap's probably smaller in terms of what they have to do but I mean at the moment it just doesn't look likely that's three without a win only one win in the last five at least they have got a game in hand on some of the sides around them but they're only six points above Salang, and for a side like Standard, that just shouldn't be the position they're in. And I don't even think the squad is that bad. I don't think it's bad enough to be in that position. I think there's some good players there that probably either the players should be performing better, they should be managed better. Like there's so many different scenarios. It's kind of like I think one of those things where if you if you just look at it in kind of like a vacuum, it's quite hard to understand but when you take the context of what's been going on into it you can kind of understand a little bit more why there's some underperformance there but Joris happy with the gank performance and the win I have an explanation why Onuachu was so reluctant to score because now he needs to find a new challenge because he scored against literally every team in the league now <laughs> so he finally completed uh, that stat I've been yeah. talking about that since uh, well last season already I think <laughs> but, uh, he did score against Standard actually twice but the first one that was actually a nice finish, but it was narrowly offside, and uh, well, it was correct decision, of course. But uh, yeah, that that was would have been a nicer way to to get that over the line. But it was an important goal. The first hour of Hink was really good, actually. Okay, they gave away a few chances on the on the breakaway, also more shots from distance, so nothing too bad. Uh, afterwards, I'm I'm still not sure whether it's like just like a bit of lax uh, being a bit lax after getting this lead and thinking you're already over the line like some other teams already have shown as well and Hink as well themselves as well before or if it's in this case already more they were putting quite some pressure on on standard and that worked really well and that they just couldn't hold it on for the 90 minutes still whether, whether there's still some physical physical delay since there might not uh, there is definitely a bigger focus on the physical aspect under the new coach than under the old one um even if that's um well still showing a bit I don't know, but all in all, quite uh, happy with the result, of course. Uh, first win against Standar in um, eight games, I believe, as well, in the in the league. And the last time this happened, I will throw in a different fact uh, uh, to as well, was uh, in the, the last title-winning season for Genk, so maybe that's a sign. Or, uh, well, there's also the other thing, Standard usually uh, this season get, get away with at least a, po- well, not, with a point uh, in away games against bigger teams uh, in the league. So, yeah, which of the two is the right omen? I think we all know the answer, but I'm not going <laughs> to do it, <laughs> answer it myself. Yeah, no, just, but a good game, efficiency, lacking a bit, I think, but when you win 2 0. Like at both sides, you can't really complain too much either. Yeah, I think uh, I think Genk were, were much the better side in this game, actually. You know, and 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 deserved winners. To be honest, look at Elsner afterwards was was actually very positive about Standard. You know, I was keen to talk about how well he thought they actually played. And while of course I think you know nobody could look at their performance and say that they played badly, I think it's for me anyway. It's same old, same old. That's the only way I can kind of describe it. And yeah, they didn't play badly, but in terms of their offensive output there's just 
you know, v- very little going on there at the moment, and they, they've almost become a, a, a counter-attacking side in that, you know, they, they get so few good offensive opportunities at the moment uh, because of the way things are that they really have to take the few opportunities that they get, and this is where players like uh, Matteo Cafaro uh, are going to become really important to them because he's he's started his, his standard career really very well, is getting a few opportunities, has, has got a couple of goals so far, and he's the sort of player who looks like you know he could take chances more often than not when he gets them, but it's it, kind of same old story for for standard really. And I, I feel like a bit of a broken record when I talk about them these days because it's it, very little seems to to change. Um, obviously, quite a few went out during the transfer window. They were able to bring in a few and, and gently reshape the squad a little bit, but I, I'm not sure that that reshaping is going to have too much of a material impact. Impact on on the remainder of the season and a playoff two spot is really really doubtful. I think um, unless they're able to go on a run, the likes of which they've they've not really been able to do up till now. Yeah, no. Just looking at the table now, so they're what thirteenth. Uh, they've still got a game to play. Most teams have played twenty seven, but they're still on twenty six, uh, twenty nine points. Genk, who obviously just lost to, are in eighth place, so the bottom of playoff two, and they're on thirty eight points. So it's a nine point swing they'd have to overcome to get there. Uh, Mechelen just above Genk. Yeah, they're going to have to go on a run and they have to go on a run soon. I think just seeing some tangible improvement towards the back end of the season should just at least be enough, if you know what I mean. Like at least kind of get the end of this season with a little bit of positivity, a little bit of like momentum or something like that, just to kind of propel you into, into the summer break and then kind of build on that from there. But yeah, it's a club that everyone knows shouldn't be languishing where it is. Like they should be doing a lot better. But we shall see what happens there. One team who are doing really well, but a minor slip in what's been a fantastic season for Union saint was It's just one of those classic things in football where everyone is so focused on like a period where you're like, right, Union are playing this team, this team, this team, this team. Like this is the biggest test of their season. We've said it. Everyone's been saying it. Like if they can get through this period, they're just going to go on. And it always seems to happen, doesn't it? That a team can get through that ridiculously tough period, and then the game you've like you've looked at, and you think there's yeah, there's no way they're going to lose that. They end up losing through no fault of their own because they definitely tried. Like, like, I only caught kind of the back end of the second half of this one and they were just all over St. Luden, but just couldn't find the breakthrough. In the 54th minute, it was Christian Brawls from the spot who gave the Canaries the lead and then they just defended for their lives, really. Like, they did kind of try and play on the counter, try and push forward through that way, but they're very happy to kind of try and quell uh, Union as much as they can, sit back, sit deep, because uh, we know that Union do like to play on the break, so kind of deny them that chance on the break. Lapusan came on, I thought he... Definitely made a difference with his kind of more direct running style. Um, it was him that won a penalty late on, but unfortunately, the ever reliable Dante Vanzir didn't convert, put it into the stands instead. And it was just then you knew it was going to be St. Tuluden's day. Uh, some good saves from Schmidt, some really good defending from the likes of Leisner, uh, Bauer. Alda Kiel came on as well. Shinji Kagawa came on and started making a couple of tactical fouls and tackles, uh, which was nice to see. It's nice to see Shinji Kagawa in the Belgian Pro League. But yeah, kind of not what we expected, was it, guys, from this one? I had a weird feeling actually about this game beforehand in, in that I did feel that the game could have been a bit of a banana skin for Union and I and I say that just based on the fact that we know how well St Truden can defend. It's it, it's definitely their strength and it was quite obvious in the opening stages of this game that they were prepared to sit deep when, when necessary and I thought have, have they come to you know actually play for a point or is this part of a, a kind of cat and mouse game where they'll sit deep when they need to but but try and hit Union on the break them, the, themselves. And I, it's just, you know, it, it's just one of those where it just didn't kind of happen for Union, really. I mean, Undav and, and Van Zier were, were were pretty invisible for virtually the entire game. And that summed up uh, Union's day, really. They just, you know, what they do well didn't click for them. You know, the ball wasn't getting up, up top quickly enough. They weren't really winning enough of the 50-50 balls uh, or the knockdowns. Uh, there weren't any overloads being set up. The, the, the transitions, they weren't getting the best of either. So none of the things that, they, you know, they, they're very good at 
and everyone knows that they they like to do just wasn't happening for them so it was just yeah a frustrating bad day at the office for them and that's how they they, they have to look at it really so Truman for their part re- really dug in actually tried to squeeze the space tried to be physical tried to make sure that some of the overloads that the union liked to set up and 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 the early balls didn't happen so there was a lot of dropping deep early to try and avoid them getting in over the top of them as well so from a tactical point of view I thought St Truden did arguably better against Union than than almost anybody's done this side I know they're not the only side this season to to have played Union and and beaten them but not many have and I think what St Truden did there will be watched and analysed probably by almost all the other sides now particularly those that are going to be playing Union again a couple of times in in playoff one in in a few weeks Um, this is a game that analysts will you know really be looking at very very heavily I think on the other hand Union will be doing exactly the same as as you would expect and and, and rightly so yeah that uh, in comparison to previous games this was a bit of an atypical game uh, for Union like like 68% of uh, positions so that's almost twice as much as they had since new year um, in in general or over all the games since other did really well like the most important takeaway for the season or not even for the scene for the for uh for the next games are i guess uh that uh union like van der Heide was already suspended now also nielsen and kandus are both suspended for charleroi game so this stream of uh, things also st- start to pile up and have also got his fourth yellow so he's a uh, close to a suspension as well so all these kind of things could start uh, for Union now and we'll have to see how they handle that but they have addressed that a bit in the in the winter window but uh, well we'll have to see how the new people uh, will fit in that squad also that was fun to see a bit of emotion with the bad refereeing, I have to say that. <laughs> bad refereeing decision. Actually, where Undav got his yellow card, which was also not really necessary yet, to be fair, but uh, where the referee should have played a clear advantage for uh, Sintrada, for the, which would have been a real big chance uh, on goal instead of well, a free kick on a, from far distance, which was wasted um, later on. But at least there was some emotion there. Like that's what we want to see a bit more, I think, uh, as, as as fans as, as well, instead of the robot robotic faces that many referees nowadays have. There will be a few suspensions against Charleroi for Union, and that leads us on to the next game. Yes, no, nicely segmented. You guys are doing a great job on the, <laughs> on the uh, transitions for me today. Um, yeah, so... We spoke about this one about being like a good test for Club Bruges, uh, Club Bruges against Sporting Charleroi and Club Bruges came out on top and who would have thought a Mats Ritz double would be the difference between the two sides. I thought Bruges going forward were good. I thought Bruges at the back weren't so great. I felt like Charleroi, when they put pressure on Bruges, they kind of could unearth a couple of like weaknesses there. But yeah, I thought Scott Olsen was good in this one. Everyone was kind of involved for that first goal. Mats Ritz with a really, really nice finish gave Kamara absolutely no chance in the 36th. Uh, and then in the 58th minute, he finished it off again with another goal. Uh, even he looked completely surprised about <laughs> grabbing a second one there. But he's been playing quite well. He's been, you can tell um, Schroeder quite likes him as a player. He's used him quite a lot. I think he's played all the games under Schroeder so far starting as well so yeah Olsen also I said like I said he was quite impressive he managed basically 90 minutes before he was subbed it was a good win for Club Bruges uh, against Charles we said they've been a really good side but especially with Union dropping points to take advantage of that as well still nine points between the two sides at the moment but Club Bruges now just two points off of Antwerp in second place and they've got a nice lead of eight points over fifth place Ghent so consolidating that playoff one spot that we knew they were more than likely to get just in i'm just interested about kind of the decision short is making i know maybe we're over analyzing i'm not sure but the fact that jack hendry's just kind of fallen by the wayside initially under schroeder he doesn't seem massively keen on him former was dropped to the bench for this one as well so interesting to see who he clearly likes like Dennis Adoy is clearly like one of his favorites because he's played every game since he's come in um it's interesting to see him being picked ahead a couple a couple of the other players isn't it yeah I think there's still a lot of um and we, we spoke about this last week there's a lot of kind of suck it and see going on from Schroeder I think he's, he's he's wanting to see how players respond the Jack Henry one's interesting uh because obviously he's had a couple of red cards recently you know there was there was a school of thought that said well he's just he's, he's resting him for a couple of games on top of the 
suspensions, you know, just, just allow them to kind of cool down. And you know what the media is like, you know, it, like, it likes to sometimes find stories that, that aren't there. And the answer on, on him specifically is we just don't know whether that's actually the case, whether it's just a bit of careful management of a player or whether there's a little bit more to this. We'll, we'll find out in the next in the next two or three weeks. It's kind of something to keep an eye on. But yeah, there's a lot of, um, I think... Yeah, there's a, there, there's a lot of exploration of, of what he has at his disposal there. And he was talking a lot this week, actually, about feeling that he didn't have nearly enough depth in the squad. Obviously, not somebody could have done anything about because he comes in far, far too late to really do anything. So it's going to be a big summer ahead there, regardless of how the rest of the season pans out for them, because I would expect players to go out and, and some new ones to come in. I'm not convinced that he has all of the players at his disposal to... To, to play the system that he wants to as well as he would like to. And I think that ex- does explain some things. Like you, Ben, I, I was quite impressed by Scott Volson. I, I thought um, he looks like an intelligent player who looks like he's up for up for football in Belgium. Um, has already spoken in, you know, in a couple of interviews about how how pleased he is to be there. So he's he's applying himself well, I think. And the 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 little bits that, of him that we have seen so far have, have kind of been kind of quite encouraging. Joris was joking last week about um you know leaving Bologna because he didn't want to play in what is basically the same system that, that he's now being asked to play in at Bruges which which is true which does beg the question uh, was it more to do with the coach than than the system which is which is sometimes the case I actually only saw half this game because I I switched over because I was um diving to to watch uh, the big game at the bottom of 1B last night as well but from what I saw of it I thought uh, Bruges Played played quite well. Ben's right. I think at the back, I think that's where probably Schroeder's biggest questions are, and that's reflected in in you know the kind of constant changes. Um, so I'm not sure he's worked out himself necessarily what the his best combination are and who he has most trust in. But I do think. And I thought this very early on. I do think we might see some some new defenders coming in in the summer there. There might be a trend with Charleroi. Uh, they've got only one point. They play, they've been playing really well, but they've only gotten one point against the, the current top four all season. So I guess they're, the position they are in is indeed uh, rightfully close to the playoff one, but not in it yet. Um, they, they just seem to have to be missing some just a little bit. Not, not much, but a little against the bigger teams um, sometimes and um, that that pays off in the classification in the end and of course uh, pays double. No, well, I, I do think the, they really should have scored as well a few times uh, but Brugge also should have scored and actually Skov Olsen he played well but he also definitely should have scored I think at least one of his chances. Of course that he gets them is really good already but um, I, w- I would have expected a better finish since he's also known for being a, quite a clinical finisher. Well, I'm, I'm sure that will come over time. Again, not that much to, uh, else to add, I guess. Yeah, no, I agree with everything that both of you guys said there. So Charlotte, obviously, like we said, have another big game next week against one of the top four. So we'll see how they do there. Surprise result at the bottom of the table. Beer Scott got a win over Courtreich, who I think since we said, yeah, they're playing well, they're doing well, I've lost like four on the bounce or something ridiculous like that. Um, so they're in a terrible run of form at the moment. But massive win for Beer Scott. Like it's, it's probably too late, but at least they're going down with a fight and it didn't start well in this game for them. Uh, Marlos Moreno with a lovely deflected goal gave Bibov absolutely no chance in goal for that one. He had a bit of a strange game and ended up getting substituted. But Biscott did get back into it. Felipe Avenatti got his first goal for the club and really, really nicely taken. Like a swivel volley from him, really good touch control to bring it down and then kind of swivel and smash it uh, past Illich who basically had no chance with that. Uh, then Ilias Saboui uh, got his second goal of the season after many will remember him getting the last minute penalty equaliser for them a week or two ago now. This one was a lot further out and a lot more spectacular. A uh, really nice build up play from Vir Scott Felter Saboui who just lashed it in and they held on. Quarter like pushed and pushed, but just couldn't get over, couldn't get another goal to equalise. So Vir Scott get a first win for a very, very, very long time. And it just still feels like if you'd only put these that sort of a victory a couple of weeks ago, you'd have been okay. But I mean, they've got a game in hand on Salang, uh, but they're at the moment seven points behind. So even if they win that, they'll still only be four points behind. And then it's, it's still a massive, massive job for them to get out of this hole. But you have to admit, when you saw kind of like 
who they were missing for this game, I gave them absolutely no chance. Like no Holzhauser, no Sanusi, um, Suzuki as well was off. Lots of COVID related absences for Beer Scott, but they put a team out and the team did the business. So I guess you've got to kind of ride this team regardless. Do you or do you think bring back Sanusi and Holzhauser and push on? Or I don't know, but I think we all agree it's probably a little bit too late, but fair play to them for not giving up. Yes, definitely. Periscott's at the attacks were in actually went really well again. Uh, Shankland didn't score, but was really crucial. Um, especially the nice flick uh, for the second goal, flick assist for the second goal was uh, really nice. And well, he had a few chances himself, uh, which didn't go in, but were well good finishes, well saved by Illich as well. Also, all goals from them were excellent, definitely in. Is it indeed a new lease of life for Beerschot or not? Well, most likely not. I mean, I'll, I'll just answer why not, <laughs> I guess, uh, since they still haven't won a game away from home and they only have three home games left, which are against Charleroi, against Ghent and against Glubrugge. So it's not looking likely that they will win all three of them. So if they wouldn't uh, get a lot out of the away games, they will need to put some, uh, some things uh, there so that isn't looking likely at least the coach i was happy in, in a way that the coach said like uh, also got like, asked the question is will this put the the miracle on its way or something like that in that um, sense he was realistic enough to say like well let's not give the fans uh, false hope we really have to put in performances like today on the pitch of course but well it is what it is at the moment and we, it would be unfair to, to realistically say that we will may make it uh, that's uh of course they will be fighting on the pitch and uh, will be interesting to see if they actually these get close but i also felt it, it's just not going to happen is it um i think that's our general feeling as well four losses in a row for uh, for Kortrijk, they really uh, seem to have fallen off a cliff uh, that seems the thing with below scenes teams yep can't disagree with anything there at all <laughs> Well, let's move on to a former court-like man uh, who is now a former Circle Bruges man, who's now the current East End man, but he was actually a former East End man as well. Eve van der Haag is back. Obviously, lots of people know Eve and that have heard us talk about him before, but why don't you give us a little bit of a breakdown for those who are unfamiliar with him about who the new old man at East End is. Yeah, very familiar new old face back with the Coos boys, Eve van der Hay. Yeah, I, very, very interesting. I mean, he sp- spent his entire career actually in Belgium as a player and and as a coach. As a player, he started off with uh, Rosala, Circle Bruges, Muscron, Anderlecht, which of course he won three titles with as a player and uh, went back to Rosala as well. And then as a coach, starts off at Kortrijk during his first spell there, goes to Oostend, has quite a successful spell there, takes him to the cup final during the period in which Anderlex Mark Cook, of course, owned owned Oostend at the time. One of the, the brighter spells in, in Eve's career as a coach, I think, that, that initial spell at Oostend. Uh, he has a year at Ghent before coming back to Kertraik for his, his second spell. He then spends uh, less than a year at, at Circle, most recently that we know all about, and is now back at Oostend. This one, if I'm honest, it kind of took me surprise a little bit this announcement because the thing for me was that he was out of a job so my feeling about it is if if Ander High was was Usten's first choice I don't understand why they don't didn't go and get him a little bit quicker and also Genoa paid in the region I think of about two million euros to buy Blessing out of his contract which is which is a really good deal for Usten and not money I think that they were expecting to have so they did have more wiggle room when it came to to going and find a new T1. If I'm if I'm being really honest, guys, I don't know what your thoughts are. I just I just don't I don't think this is the best appointment they could have made. I think it's a sensible appointment on a kind of short term basis, I suppose. But there's nothing about this that tells me it's it's long term or to be really blunt about it, particularly interesting either. I I think. I think Eve's spell at Circle was kind of quite difficult because I think there was clearly a, a gap between how he felt the side were doing and, and what the rest of the club in terms of the technical staff felt about the direction the club were going in. So there was there was a degree of disagreement there on, on a number of levels. So I, I still kind of don't really understand this unless it's kind of a safe temporary option really until they're perhaps waiting for their, their, their real choice, if you like, to, to maybe become 
have available. Yeah, it really feels like a stopgap solution indeed. Yeah. Yeah, no, that is literally my first thought when I saw it. And I think I completely agree, Scott. I'm like, he was available. You could have just gone and got him when you wanted him, which <laughs> reminds me a bit of my own club. Uh, if any Reading fans are listening, you'll know that the situation we're in. And I've heard Rosala there, and you'll remember that our former, the former Reading owner owned Rosala, who now don't exist anymore. And it's like Reading are going the same way. But anyway, it's always, I'd never understand appointments where if the guy has been available and you can just go get them, why don't, if they're your number one, go get them. If they're not, then... We'll, we all can see. Do you know what I mean? Like we all know he's clearly not their number one choice because, like you said, he, he was there and ready. I do wonder if they were thinking, okay, we'll just give it a little bit of time, see what happens, see if there is an improvement. And then I think maybe he was just always on kind of like, if we need to get someone in and we can't get someone in, we will just go back to Eve because we know he knows the league. He'll probably keep us up. And maybe this is going to be his niche now. He's just going to be employed every February just to keep a side in the league. And that's going to be his his little thing, kind of like a Tony Pulis style, Sam Allardyce thing where you get a job for a couple of months, keep someone up and then you have a nice little holiday. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, I think the lack of excitement, I think blessing was so exciting. And I think that's the problem we have is that you've gone from blessing to Van Hagen. It's just not, it's not exciting, is it? Like, let's be honest, we know what we're going to get. We're not seeing anyone new, which is kind of what we like to see, but I hope he does well. I hope he obviously, I'm pretty sure he will keep them up. I think they're going to be fine just because of the teams below them aren't as great, but yeah, I'd be interested to see what direction they go in the summer in terms of recruitment and all that sort of stuff because they like to play that pressing game that Circle of Rouge like to also play, but he wasn't really playing that at Circle of Rouge. So it's kind of like that bit confuses me a little bit to see, okay, is he just going to come in and play that style of play or not? What's the deal there? Are you changing how you play or are you just being pragmatic and being like, we'll just play how he plays to keep us up and then we'll go back to what has worked? That was a weird thing in the in the press announcement as well, of course, that uh, Kotir Ganai actually mentioned that like, we like this pressing style. I said, well, you're not, you're not fooling yeah. anyone here. This was just a template that was there for, and you just filled in a name yeah. now? Or... <laughs> yeah. there, was that, there, was that, there was a particular quote in there, guys, as well, that, that really kind of made me fall off my seat. And that was the bit when they were talking about when they when they looked at the work that, that he'd done at Circle, that they directly credited him with the uh, the current good form that Circle are on. Now, I know there's this argument that the big discovery, if you like, in a data sense had been made. So they'd worked out the formula that they were about to apply. But obviously, as part of that, you know, they, they decided they needed a, a coach who was, was much more on trend, for want of a phrase, with what the data was saying and more of a track record with that. And there was obviously a disagreement. But to actually come out and say that, you know, we feel that, you know, he's directly responsible for the good work that's gone on since he left is frankly bizarre because it's a kind of night and day approach that that, that club have had with their success. It's just, it's, it's really bizarre. But it's the money thing that I was alluding to me as well. I mean, Oostend have got so much more wiggle room now in terms of what's possible. You know, they could they could go and spend some money on buying somebody out of a contract if they really wanted to, or they could conceivably go and get somebody that normally they wouldn't have been able to because of that. So there's, there's nothing when you look at the evidence and reading between the lines that makes that much sense here but you know like you guys absolutely wish him well you know he's a very well-known face in Belgian football and I, I actually like it when I see a CV and I see somebody who's stayed in Belgium for their entire career that to me is a that's a great thing and it's worth mentioning as well that you know he had quite an illustrious uh, international career as well you know 48 caps two goals doesn't sound like that much but you know he was a regular and as a player as well you know for those of you who are old enough to remember he was one of those players who were quietly effective without being particularly flashy and that's how I would describe his coaching style as well for most of his career. Yeah and well, on the money thing well maybe they just felt like well we're not gonna be relegated we're not gonna get into playoff and so this well by it was still eight games left it's like well why would we spend all the money now already maybe we'll just wait for the next season and then we save even more money. <laughs> yeah and then they can invest in some new mascot outfits to not scare everyone. Um, that would be nice. Speaking of, well, probably not speaking of, but yeah, speaking of mascots and fans and all that, we're going to have some fans back. Away fans, that is. So we'll have a little bit more spice at all the games. Food and drink as well. So it's still only, I think they've got the capacity to 80%. So it's not full capacity, but we're getting there. We're getting back to normality. And hopefully at some point those fans will include us and we'll be the ones enjoying some food and drink in the stands. But 
have to wait and see. Some sad news coming out of Antwerp for Victor Fischer. Looks like his season's over with the injury that he suffered. It's definitely worse than they first feared. So they'll be without him for the running, which is a big shame because at points in the season, he had looked really, really good and really effective. Thankfully, Miyoshi's back, so he can kind of fill that role. Balakwisha as well. And they can get Benson back fit. That would be big for them. But yeah, wish him well in his recovery and hopefully we'll see him, if not at the end, back end of this season, starting the next season fully fit and able again. Next season, we'll also be seeing some new teams from 1B. Scott, I mean, we say it every week, but just so much happening there again. Yeah, 1B's, 1B's getting more interesting week on week, as you know, as we approach the, the squeaky bum time uh, period in, in in the season. I actually, uh, I was able to take in a, a, a full 1B one, one game. I watched the big game at the bottom between uh, Lommel and Burton, you know, the, the big six-pointer. Definitely, that's that's what this kind of turned out to be. We score round up this weekend, as usual. Uh, Beveren lost 1-0 at home to, to Laers, who, it turns out Laers are kind of one of the the form sides, believe it or not, at the moment. In their last four, they've taken eight out of twelve points, which they'll be absolutely delighted with because they were in relative free fall up to that point. So you know they they're in not a bad run of form at the moment. Westerlo winning one 0 at home against Muscron. Uh, Muscron having an early goal chopped off. Molenbeek winning one 0 at home against Denza, which means that they open up a five point gap over Beveren, who've dropped down to third. Now in Interestingly, these two play each other this coming weekend, so this is going to come at, uh, quite a quite a tasty point uh, fixture wise. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that one, and I'm certainly hoping to to watch that game this coming weekend as well. In terms of the bigger picture, Westerlo obviously they're they're still top. They're now eight points clear with eight games to go. Beveren have slipped to third, so there's some jostling really going on now as things get intense for that that playoff spot. Lommel, I mentioned watching Lommel. Verton. Lommel managed to get their first win in 13 this weekend and they have now opened up a, a five point gap over uh, Verton at the bottom and that that's that's obviously huge for Lommel. Uh, I think if they'd lost that then you know it really would have been you know dagger in the heart stuff because of the run that they were on the the worst run in their history which they've managed to now kind of break. They, they played reasonably well uh, in that game last night there was a, a lot of kind of structure and intent to their play. They, they wanted it more I thought and they ran out 3-0 winners deservedly um, I've put a bit of daylight between them and Verton now and I actually think probably one more win in the remaining eight games will will be enough to to, to secure their their one B place for another season. You would like to see them get more than that, and I'm sure they're aiming for more than that. But I think the way that Verton are playing, I think one more win will probably be enough for Lommel. Yeah, no, definitely. I think when you look at that table, you'd have predicted you wouldn't have predicted Lommel being there. That's for sure at the beginning of the season. But I think most pundits and most of us would have thought that Verton are going to be the team that struggles the most just because of the preparation they had and kind of they had to just get a team together and stick it out there and just hope for the best and that's what they've done and they've they've been competitive by and large but that's what four defeats in a row for them yeah I think I think give Lommel Lommel get another win and it's probably over for them but fair play they've they've stuck it and tried to fight it out Dens is one that must they must be very frustrated because they did we spoke a little bit about this last week they they had the Vestalo game they did the business in that they beat Vestalo 3-0 away from home like fantastic result and then to go to Molenbeek and they had that chance didn't they to really put themselves amongst the uh, battle for second place and that would have been a massive if they could have won that one to kind of really squeeze the gap between Molenbeek Beveren and themselves but losing to Molenbeek and Molenbeek being on that run yeah I think if you've got the time this weekend and I think was it the seven the UK time 7.45 kickoff on Saturday evening like Faso Beveren against Molenbeek is definitely one of the games to watch because two teams there are going to be absolutely going for it and I think they're going to have in my opinion, they though who whichever of those teams gets into second place is gonna have a really, really good shot at going up because both of them pushing each other and forcing them to play well and forcing them to like they need to win every game and like going into those games with high pressure will serve them well for when they get to the playoff. And they'll be coming into it with some momentum. So one A teams definitely be be wary of thinking, Oh, it's fine, we'll just drop into that playoff position and we'll be fine. Like unless Beer Scott are coming up into it, it's gonna be a team dropping down into that relegation playoff spot in 1A so yeah I think either of those sides get into that relegation playoff and they've got a great chance of going up 
Yeah, I think that's the thing, isn't it? You know, it's a really important point that, that Ben highlights there. I think, you know, the, the side that does finish in the playoff will, will be going into it with a, with their tails up. And we saw exactly that last year, actually, with uh, with Beveren and Sarang. Um, Sarang, obviously, you know, serial winners last year, you know, running high in confidence for most of the season, went into that playoff high in confidence with nothing to lose and played very well over the course of both legs. And I think the same scenario is, is, is going to play out almost certainly this season and that's 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 absolutely what, what to watch out for because you, you cannot go into a, a game like that assuming that because you're necessarily the one A side that you know a couple of good games is going to be enough because you know you, you're in the playoff spot you've got absolutely nothing to lose and you've been playing well and confidence for most of the season that goes without saying that you know you're going to come into the game really charged up Molenbeek actually um, are going into the game against Bevan this week Weekend off the back of six wins and seven, and it's that run of form that's allowed them to overturn Beveren and, and get into the second. They've they've both had a very busy transfer window as well. It's worth mentioning that briefly. Both both Molenbeek and and Beveren have brought in a lot of players, so they clearly are aware that you know of each other's abilities and and know that it's probably going to be one of those two that finishes in that spot. And both of them are are really trying to add depth to their squad and 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 go for it to get over. The line. I think it's a bit too early to talk about such things because it could also be that RWDM, if one of the teams is most likely RWDM or even Westerlo even falls into second place somehow still, it isn't looking likely, then they also don't necessarily means that, that they will be in a good run because RWDM could be able to secure it if they keep on going with that run uh, and drop off in the last few games uh, and still scraping uh, that second place or if Westerlo really have a fall off really, then, then they will also not be in full confidence so it's way too early to talk about such things uh, in my mind that's things we should talk about in probably a month or so I'd really love to know kind of what, what internally what points target Westerlo have set sat for kind of getting over the line but they think they're kind of there you know because obviously mathematically looking at it you know an, another another five wins I think would probably be enough but they'd be there even sooner than that obviously if if, if Molenbeek dropped points before then but equally again of course it goes the other way as Joris was saying if Molenbeek be able to maintain anything like this run, then you know they might get much closer to, to Westerlo than Westerlo would like. I think the, the big thing in this as well is it is worth mentioning, and we haven't we haven't touched on this. Westerlo have dropped off a little bit recently. You know, they haven't not in a way that you know you would really notice because you know they've been immovable pretty much all season, but the, their performance levels have dropped a little bit. So if you're Molenbeek, there is there's there's a little bit of a chink here that, that would give you hope that you know possibly possibly we could catch them yeah and and, and to keep going sorry yeah, um easy. yeah okay. well uh, of course it's also worth mentioning if Westerlo do keep performing or get it back uh back more on track than they are at the moment that could also uh, imp- uh have some int- implications for all of the other positions if they're already over the line of course uh in teams that's well, still, when they still have to get over the line, or when they are already there, that that could influence well, basically everything in the in the league yeah, as well. Bas- the bottom, then I guess in the middle, it doesn't matter too much. It, depending on the timing of the games, then uh, that will also be interesting to see if that influences things as well. Yeah, and it's definitely worth mentioning as well. We're talking about this um, this Bever and Molenbeek game, and they play each other again on like I think it's the eighth of April or around that time. So it's just like. It just keeps coming in this league. Like we're saying, there's only eight games left, but that's still what, like, you're still playing everyone again. Like, teams are going to take points off each other. So, yeah, it's definitely one to watch. I think it's just quite an exciting league, as we've always mentioned. Let's just quickly look ahead to next week before we finish. Uh, as we said, we have Genk Mechelen on the midweek uh, on Wednesday. Friday night, we start with Ghent Sarang, another Friday night game for them. I feel like they're always playing Friday night games at the moment. Um, they're away at Ghent. Uh, Circle of Rouge hosts Beer Scott on the Saturday. Kortreich holds Stuttgart again. Two sides that could desperately do with getting some form turnaround. Uh, Usten against Standard could be an interesting one there. Uh, Charleroi, as we've already mentioned, they host Union saint Loire to end on Saturday evening. Uh, going to Sunday, the midday game is Antwerp against Mechelen. Uh, Urpen host Club Bruges. Anderlecht host Genk. And then we finished off with St. Truden against Leuven. Quickly, guys, which one of those games are you looking forward to the most? I think Antwerp Mechelen looks looks very tasty. Well, there's also the derby between Kortrijk and Zultewaarchem uh, as well. That could be also be interesting mm-hmm. if Zultewaarchem can get something out of that. And if Kortrijk, um, well, 
can manage to straighten their backs and turn the, their bad form around a little. Yeah, no, definitely. I think, yeah, the one I mentioned, like East End Standard, I'm quite interested to see how that one goes with those two teams kind of struggling down the bottom. But as usual, plenty of exciting games. And that about wraps it up for this one. Another long one. Uh, we just want to say thank you to everyone that's already listened to the Union St. Gervais special with Alex Muzio. Um, I know lots of people have been enjoying it. So yeah, hope you enjoy that. We also recently released our transfer window review. So you can catch up on all the teams, all the moves and all of our thoughts on that as well. And then you've got this episode as well. So there's plenty to listen to when it comes to Belgian football. Coming up this weekend in terms of the Mola TV ones, uh, I think it's Charlotte against Union on the Saturday, Antwerp Mechel on the Sunday, and then Anderlecht Genk also on the Sunday. And then obviously, if you're in other countries, you can watch either on One Football or the Eleven Sports website if you're looking for some of the other games. Scott and Joss, as always, thank you very much for joining me. Pleasure, guys. Have a great week, everyone, and we'll see you soon. I'll be back to editing. I've, I feel like I've not done it for so long now. Thanks to you, everyone, for listening to this episode. Uh, you can... Get in touch with us in the usual places on Twitter. Uh, you can either do that individually or through the Belgian Podcast Twitter account. Or you can email us at belgianfootpodcast at gmail.com. Also, if you feel like it, give us a rating on Spotify, Apple or any other podcast app of choice. Thank you once again for listening and we'll see you very soon on another episode of the Belgian Football Podcast. <laughs>